Good morning, everyone, and welcome, welcome to our service. Let's all sing about how we want God to shape and form our lives. Holiness, holiness is what I long for. Holiness is what I need. Holiness, holiness is what you want from me. So take my heart and form it. Take my mind, transform it. Take my What I long for, faithfulness is what I need. Faithfulness, faithfulness is what you want from me. So take my heart and form it. Take my mind and transform it. Take my Righteousness is what I long for. Righteousness is what I need. Righteousness, righteousness is what you want for me. So take my heart and form it. Take my mind, transform it. Take my It's a delight to be back with you. We had a wonderful, wonderful time in Colorado. Uh, it was a great joy to introduce my uh, Hunley grandchildren to the mountains. And uh, we just had an exceptional time. I'm grateful uh, for the opportunity. I'm grateful for Mark uh, preaching a wonderful sermon for you last week. And delighted that you've all gathered either here or at home in worship together this morning. We ask God to bless us to accept our worship, to challenge us in our thinking, and to indeed transform us into the image of God. That's indeed our desire. Announcements today. What kind of celebrations do we have? Char? We celebrated our 50th yesterday at the bridge. We have, but we had to sit across from each other and we couldn't touch each other. So you had your 50th anniversary yesterday. All right, congratulations to you guys. Uh, well, Lee, Lee was excited that at least he wasn't going to have to look at you through the, the window outside. So you were actually in the same room together. Oh, outdoors room. Okay, all right, all right. Well, happy anniversary to you, and trust Lee is continuing to improve. And uh, thank you for celebrating and letting us share in that. Yes. Today. Your little sister's 12th birthdays today? Ooh, Emmy, happy birthday to you. All right, all right. Any other celebrations going on? Yes, Paul. It's 21st anniversary Friday. Was? Whoops. <laughs> Grandma, do you remember that? Okay, Grandma took care of it. Uh, happy anniversary to my daughter and son-in-law. <laughs> all right, all right. Anything else this morning? 
Okay, again, we're delighted that you're here. It looks like uh, we're maintaining a nice social distance and uh, most are masked and we're trying to do what's right as best we can. And I think God will bless our efforts and our faithfulness as we worship uh, in uncertain days in the hands of a certain Savior. And we're grateful for that. Let's continue worshiping him this morning. came to live, live a perfect life. He came to be the living word of our life. He came to die, so we'd be reconciled. He came to rise, to show his power and might. That's why we praise him, that's why we sing, that's why we offer him our Cause he gave his everything He came to live, to live, live again in us He came to be our conquering king and friend He came to heal and show the lost ones his love He came to go, prepare a place for us Cause he gave his everything Cause he gave his everything
This is my desire to honor you, Lord, with all my heart, I worship you. to you we come to you broken we come to you in need of of a savior and lord you have you have provided that you have you've given us a savior you have made us complete we just thank you lord for all that you've done we thank you for this life that we live this wonderful earth that you've created for us and for the promise of heaven. We just worship your holy name and we praise you for for all that you do and for all that you are. In Jesus' name, amen.
Singing praises together is a, an amazing experience. But you know, sometimes it's even more amazing to stop singing and just listen to the saints. Uh, you've all blessed me greatly today, and I'm sure you've blessed the Lord in your singing. Uh, it's absolutely beautiful just to hear you sing. God is good, and he's blessed us in some amazing ways. And he's promised us a future without sorrow or pain or separation. And we anticipate that day. Until then, we look to him for strength and confidence to face each day. And we take opportunities to pray for one another. And this morning, I would encourage you to keep Jack Rubish in your prayers and, and Bonnie. Uh, Jack's had a very, very difficult week. He had uh, brain surgery. They went in and, and opened up uh, his skull on both sides to relieve uh, pressure uh, that had built up from brain bleeds. Uh, he's in the intensive care unit. He is responsive, uh, but kind of began slipping yesterday, and they had to insert a, a nasal tube for feeding and medication. And last night, they had to put him on a ventilator, so Bonnie is uh, quite concerned. Eric is running her up there now, and uh, so I'm sure they would, would definitely appreciate your prayers, um, just for God's comfort and his strength, um, if not even his healing, which would be wonderful. Are there other needs that we can be aware of this morning, other than Lee, of course, as we continue praying for Lee and for his uh, restoration? Other things, yes. going in for surgery this week, um, hopefully to resolve some long-term consequences from an accident that's caused a lot of pain, and we pray for relief for Rachel very nicely. Anything else this morning? Yes, Paul. Pray for all our college students going on, because God puts the right kids in place, the right friends. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a big day for some of our uh, college-bound students. Uh, Grace is heading off to college tomorrow. Um, Abby, when do you go? The 19th. And Reagan, the 
20 seconds. Okay, it's a time of uh, change, a time of challenge, uh, a time when we, of course, continue undergirding our young people in prayer. Uh, we trust that God is sending them to places where they can be effective witnesses for him, that their faith can uh, be strengthened as they face the challenges and they, they come out of college even better prepared uh, to serve the kingdom wherever God uses them and sends them. And so and we pray for you, Abby, we pray for you. Uh, assure Reagan, we're praying for her and uh, the rest of our college-bound kids. Uh, it's a big change. And we pray for parents and grandparents who are going to be left behind, uh, but not too far behind. Okay, all right, all right. All right. Well, let's just go before the throne of grace together. Father, we come before you with, with hearts that are broken, but hearts that have been mended mended by your love and by your promise and by the hope that you've brought to us through Christ. Thank you, Father. Thank you for entering into our world and into our sorrows and our hardships, enduring things that uh, we face, enduring more than we face, and then rising to assure us that there's life after death. We pray for each other. We pray for Jack. We pray for Bonnie. Pray for Lee. We pray for others who are facing uh, physical difficulties and for those of our body and our extended family who are facing emotional and, and even spiritual struggles with all the uncertainty in, in the world today. Keep us grounded. Keep us grounded in confidence that uh, you have saved us, you've prepared a place for us, and you'll see us safely to that destination. Guide us, Father, as we study your word together. Help us to be challenged as to uh, our response to the claims of Jesus in our life. Help us to respond in a way that honors him and changes us. That's my prayer in Jesus' name. She goes to her job <clears throat> only 52 days a year and is given $900,000 a day to do so. She's the highest paid TV personality and is watched by over 10 million viewers every day. Who is it? It's Judge Judy. Apparently, people are fascinated by courtroom drama, even the trivial issues that are resolved on a TV show. But then again, we're also captivated by actual trials that take place in real courtrooms. You know, who didn't keep tabs on the trial of George Zimmerman, Scott Peterson, Timothy McVeigh, Jeffrey Dahmer, and the Menendez brothers? Who didn't watch at least some of the proceedings of the first nationally televised trial, the trial of Ted Bundy? And of course, there's the O.J. Simpson trial, the trial of the last century. Indeed, there have been a lot of famous trials throughout history, but without a doubt, the most famous trial of all was the trial of Jesus. His trial didn't take long. It began in the middle of the night on a Thursday, and by 9 a.m. on Friday, he was on a cross. But he appeared before several judges in that short period of time. He was taken first to Annas, the defrocked high priest, and then to Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin. We watched that trial unfold two weeks ago. This week we go to the court of Pilate. The Sanhedrin condemned Jesus to death but lacked the authority to execute him. The Roman governor would have to make that decision. And as we'll see, it wasn't a decision he wanted to make. 
But he wasn't given a choice. Whether he wanted to or not, Pilate had to answer the question, what do you do with the Son of God? And in our text for today, we find four answers to that question, only one of which came from Pilate. The priests said, condemn him. The people said, replace him. Pilate tried to evade him, and the soldiers trivialized him. What do you do with the Son of God? Let's look at those four responses and then offer a fifth. We're in Mark chapter 15 this morning. And early in the morning, the chief priests and the elders and scribes and the whole council immediately held a consultation. And binding Jesus, they led him away and delivered him up to Pilate. And Pilate questioned him, Are you the king of the Jews? And answering, he said to him, It is as you say. And the chief priest began to accuse him harshly. And Pilate was questioning him again, saying, Do you make no answer? See how many charges they bring against you? But Jesus made no further answer, so that Pilate was amazed. The priests were the first to answer the question. Their answer was, condemn him. Get rid of him. Silence him. They had already tried Jesus. And at dawn, they made official what they had decided to do with Jesus long before the trial began. Kill him. There was only one problem. They had found Jesus guilty of blasphemy, claiming to be the Son of God, but Jesus wouldn't be executed by Rome on the charge of blasphemy, so new charges had to be made. Luke tells us they came up with three initial charges to bring before Pilate. Terrorism, tax evasion, and treason. They charged that he was misleading the nation, arousing troublemakers, causing riots and dissension. That he was forbidding the paying of tribute to Rome, teaching people not to pay their taxes. And that he claimed to be king. That last one caught Pilate's attention. So he asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus' answer is a bit vague. He really didn't say yes or no. The New American Standard translates his answer as, it is as you say, but the italics indicate the translators inserted the words, it is as. According to the Greek, Jesus simply said, you say. He doesn't really admit it or deny it. Because while he is in fact king of kings and lord of lords, the Jews didn't accept him as their king. And he had no intention of becoming a political king. John tells us that Jesus even told Pilate his kingdom was not of this world. So in his answer, Jesus made it clear that his kingship was no threat to Rome. The priests wanted it to appear that way. But they, couldn't, they could see that Pilate wasn't taking their charges seriously. So they began to accuse him of many things. The word translated harshly can also mean of many things. But Jesus remained silent. And that frustrated Pilate. Because he could have dismissed all the charges if Jesus had only defended himself. Pilate knew the priests had brought Jesus to them because of envy. He could tell by the nature of their charges. But by remaining silent, Jesus condemned himself. What Pilate didn't realize was that Jesus had no reason to prolong the trial, to try to save himself. He knew how it was going to end. He had accepted it as God's will. But his silence did make it evident to Pilate what was in the priests' hearts. Jesus had been a threat to them. The people listened to him when he talked, and 
His righteousness exposed their hypocrisy. So they wanted him out of the picture. The priests condemned him because they wanted to get rid of him. That's one way to answer the question, what do you do with the Son of God? Get rid of him. <laughs> but that's not easy. And it's not a common answer. Occasionally you'll get someone who's bold enough to condemn the Son of God and try to silence him, but not many people deal with him that way. Most people realize that they cannot get rid of the Son of God, so few people actually try. But there are other reactions to him that are just as damaging. Many people who don't like what Jesus has to say and what he asks of them simply replace him. Let's read on. Now at the feast, he, Pilate, used to release for them any one prisoner whom they requested. And the man named Barabbas had been imprisoned with the insurrectionists who had committed murder in the insurrection. And the multitude went up and began asking him to do as he had been accustomed to do for them. And Pilate answered them, saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he was aware that the chief priests had delivered him up because of envy. But the chief priests stirred up the multitude to ask him to release Barabbas for them instead. It was now the people's turn. What would they do with the Son of God? Rome had apparently given Pilate the authority to release one prisoner requested by the Jews at the Passover. It was an obvious attempt to appease them, to keep down hostile feelings by releasing a political prisoner for political reasons. And that's usually a good thing to do, unless, of course, He's been arrested by a competing political party that put someone there. But be that as it may, when the people approached Pilate to release a prisoner for Passover, he thought he had an out. He offered to release Jesus. Again, the priest went around that. They had already made sure that the people would ask for someone else. They convinced the people to ask for Barabbas. Barabbas was a political prisoner who had been involved in an insurrection against Rome during which someone had been killed. It's not clear whether he had actually done the killing, but he was no doubt a hero to the militant Jews who hated Rome. So it wasn't hard to convince the people to seek his release. Now, there's something very interesting about his name. Barabbas means son of the father, son of Abba, the same word Jesus used when addressing his father in the Garden of Gethsemane. Even more interesting is the fact that several old manuscripts also give him the name Jesus, referring to him as Jesus Barabbas, which would make his name mean Jesus Son of the Father. Now that may just be coincidence. Or God may have arranged it to teach us a very important lesson. But however it happened, the people had to choose between two Jesuses. One Jesus, Son of the Father, was a man who did what the people wanted who was willing to lead in a popular uprising using violence and force. The other Jesus, son of the Father, sought only to do his Father's will and couldn't be swayed by the multitudes. He was willing even to sacrifice himself to accomplish his Father's will. One would rule by force, the other by love. And the people chose Barabbas. Why? Why? I'm convinced the people chose Barabbas because they were disappointed with Jesus Christ. 
He didn't do what they wanted, what they expected. They had welcomed him to Jerusalem just a few days earlier and cried out to him to save them. Now he was standing before Pilate, unwilling or unable to defend himself. He certainly wasn't what they wanted. So they chose Barabbas. You know, there are times when we have a similar choice to make. There are times when we get disappointed by God, when he doesn't do what we think he ought to do or what we want him to do. There are times when it seems to us that he doesn't know what he's doing or that he just doesn't care. It's at that moment that we have to choose because there's always another Jesus waiting in the wings, someone who appears to be doing what we want. It's not always easy for us to remember, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. We can't figure God out. And in our confusion, there's always a temptation to create a God we want and to choose another Jesus. That's what the people did. When faced with the question, what do you do with the Son of God? They said, replace him. And then there are some who just don't want to choose, who don't want to decide one way or another, so they try to evade him. And answering again, Pilate was saying to them, then what shall I do with him whom you call the king of the Jews. And they shouted back, crucify him. But Pilate was saying to them, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, crucify him. And wishing to satisfy the multitude, Pilate released Barabbas for them. And after having Jesus scourged, he delivered him to be crucified. Pilate didn't want to make a decision. He didn't want to have to decide what to do with the Son of God. According to Luke, as soon as he realized Jesus was a Galilean, he sent him to King Herod for judgment, who was in town for the Passover and was delighted to have a chance to meet Jesus. He had heard about him and really wanted to see him perform a miracle. Of course, Jesus did not perform for him. In fact, he said nothing when standing before him. So Herod sent him back to Pilate, who really didn't want him. Pilate's wife even had a dream about Jesus and told him to have nothing to do with him because he was a righteous man. But the crowd was demanding that he crucify him. He could see no reason to do so. And even asked the mob, why? What evil has he done? But they just shouted all the more, crucify him. Pilate was caught in the middle. He knew Jesus was innocent of any crime deserving death, but still the people wanted it. They were demanding it. It was his call to make, but he didn't want to make it. So he tried to evade it, to dodge it, by having Jesus scourged. Scourging was terrible, far worse than whipping. A scourge was a whip made of leather thongs tipped with bits of stone, glass, metal, or bone. Men's backs would be literally torn to shreds 
with a scourge, often exposing bone and not infrequently resulting in death. It was a horrible punishment. But Pilate was hopeful it would get him off the hook. He hoped it would appease the mob. After the scourging, he brought Jesus out and said, Behold, the man. Surely they could see he had been horribly punished, and that would settle it. But no, they kept crying, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate had hoped to avoid making a decision. He had hoped to straddle the fence and please the people without really making a decision about Jesus. And it didn't work. He had a pitcher of water brought out and washed his hands in front of them saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. In effect saying, I wash my hands of this whole affair. It was his way of trying to free himself of any responsibility. He didn't want to be involved. But he was. That was the son of God standing before him. And no one can skirt the issue when it comes to Jesus. Every man has to decide what to do with him and his claims. Even doing nothing is doing something. To fail to accept him is to reject him. No one can evade him, even though many try. The last reaction we see to Jesus' claim to be the Son of God is to trivialize him. And the soldiers took him away into the palace, that is, the praetorium, and they called together the whole Roman cohort. And they dressed him up in purple. And after weaving a crown of thorns, they put it on him. And they began to acclaim him, Hail, King of the Jews! And they kept beating his head with a reed and spitting at him and kneeling and bowing down before him. And after they had mocked him, they took the purple off him and put his garments on him and they led him out to crucify him. Why did the soldiers treat Jesus like that? He had done nothing to them. So why did they mock him and ridicule him? It was because they did not take his claim to be king seriously. They thought it was funny to have a condemned man before them who thought he was king. They dressed him up like a king and bowed before him in mock obeisance to make light of him, to trivialize him. They didn't take him seriously and did not want to take him seriously. This, I think, is a very common reaction to Jesus. People don't take him seriously. They don't want to take him seriously. They don't want to believe who he is or what he says. Because if they did, their lives would have to change. So they try to blow him off. He has said some pretty powerful things and made some pretty fantastic claims. And as long as people can laugh it off, they don't have to face it. But in trying to laugh him off by trivializing his claims, they mock and insult him just as much as did the soldiers in that guardhouse 2,000 years ago. 
It's a very foolish thing to trivialize the Son of God. So what do we do? If we don't condemn him, replace him, evade him, or trivialize him, what do we do with him? Obviously, we accept him and his claims and make him our Lord and Savior. If you don't make that decision, you are making one of the other four. So what are you going to do with the Son of God? I pray you're going to surrender to his lordship, his lordship over you and over your life. That is the only appropriate response to the question, what do you do with the Son of God? Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning acknowledging Jesus as Lord. We take seriously his claims. We take personally his commands. We don't, we don't trivialize him. We don't try to evade him. We don't try to create him in our own image. We accept him. And we serve him. I pray that our activity, our faithfulness in serving Christ will challenge those around us to take seriously his claims. They will see that by yielding to his lordship, we have assurance. We have confidence even in dark times and in the midst of pandemics and whatever else sin has brought into our world. People want hope today, but the only hope they have is in Christ and in making him their Lord and yielding to his lordship, acknowledging who he is and surrendering fully to him and the will of his Father in heaven. Thank you, Father, for giving us the privilege of doing just that. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I surrender.
before I begin, handwritten, that's a scary thought, that means it did not go through the editor's desk. <laughs> she has been on pins and needles, so pardon any grammatical errors. Because, as most of you know, Grace is heading off to college tomorrow. And due to her very active schedule, I haven't got too much of a chance to give her some fatherly advice. So I thought I would seize this opportunity right now. <laughs> I figured she's wide awake after Grandpa's sermon, so this is a great time. So here it goes. I've titled it, Life Advice from Your Earthly Dad and Your Heavenly Father. Number one, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Number two, don't skip class. <laughs> Number three, Acts 2, 42 and they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and the breaking of bread and to prayer. Do church. Find a body of believers who care for you like a family. You have had a great example of this growing up. Number four, call your mom and dad. We will love to hear your voice. Number five, Mark 1, 14 through 19. And he, as he was going along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net in the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, I will make you become fishers of men. And they immediately left their nets and followed him, and were going on a little further. He saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were also in the boat mending nets. And immediately he called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants, and they went away to follow him. These friends had the same beliefs. These were also friends who would die for the truth. Pick your friends wisely. Number six, nothing good happens after midnight. <laughs> Number seven. Matthew 5, 13, 14, and 16. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, how will it be made salty again? It is good for nothing anymore except to be thrown out and trampled under foot of men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Grace, there is no doubt in my mind that God has a plan for you at ISU. You are being placed at a university that needs to see the light of God. I have full confidence that you will let it shine. Stay focused on the truth and on the foundation that you believe in. I know that it will not always be easy, but your reward will be great. Now, unlike Jesus with Zacchaeus, if a man is staring at you from a tree, do not invite yourself to his house to stay. <laughs> Witness in any other method. <laughs> Number eight, don't walk at night alone. Find a friend to be by your side. Number nine, your body is the temple of God. Ooh. How did that get in there again? <laughs> Number 10, Matthew 21, 21 through 22. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. If you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what is done to the fig tree, but also you can say to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and it will be done. And all things you ask in prayer, believing you shall receive. Don't ever underestimate the power of prayer. Your Heavenly Father is always there and always listening. Talk to Him as a friend and ask with His will in mind when you are asking. He is a comforter, a healer, and a protector. Grace, I know these are some very lofty goals and standards, none of which I doubt that you can do. But always remember that your Father, your Mother, and your Heavenly Father will always love you no matter what. And not only will we always love 
but we will always sacrifice for you, and we will always forgive. Nikki and I have loved, sacrificed, and forgave a lot along the way while you were growing up, but none of this compares to the love, sacrifice, and forgiveness that Christ has done for you. You are holding in your hands the key to a heavenly home that is far greater than everything we ever gave you. You are holding in your hands a love that is deeper than we can even imagine. You are holding in your hands emblems that represent the greatest sacrifice. You are holding in your hands Christ's blood and body, which wiped away your sins to be totally forgiven and your slate made clean. A father who sent his son who died for you, that is his gift. Grace, we love you. Let your light shine as your wings spread, but never forget Christ loves you more. Heavenly Father, indeed, may we always seek to follow you with all of our hearts, Lord. May your word guide us in our life. May it be a light for us to uh, shine in the darkness. And I pray that we may cling to your truth, Lord. And I pray that our actions may cause others to notice and to realize that they need you in their lives, too. You are the Son of God. You came down to this earth. You took away our sin. May we always have faith in you and trust in you all of our life. In Jesus' name, amen.